Good evening. It is six o'clock and we're gonna get started on this. Can folks hear me? Uh, John, can you hear me? Sure can. Beautiful. My name is Tracy Ferdinand. I'm the director of the Center for Global Environmental Education. And you are in for a great treat tonight as we're working with some great folks who are uh, uh, showing this tool for the very first time as a world premiere. So that's something to be very, very happy about. Uh, just a bit more about who we are. Uh, our center is celebrating our 31st year uh, at Hamlin University. Uh, Hamlin University is Minnesota's oldest university founded in 1854. Uh, very proud of the fact that the first two graduates were the Soren sisters who went on to an illustrious uh, teaching uh, career in the territory of Minnesota so many years ago. Uh, I've been the director since 19... 96 of this uh, organization and our mission is to foster environmental literacy and stewardship in citizens of all ages and we're built on four cornerstones um, professional development for teachers uh, we do have some institutes coming up this summer you'll learn more about uh, multimedia tools of which you're going to be seeing some examples Watching of teacher uh, education our, our k-12 curriculum uh components that are tied to and community outreach uh, we do believe that through an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary lens of arts and science, we can come together to accomplish great things for our society and environment. Uh, we're really excited tonight. Uh, we're in about a year and a half of our Waters to the Sea stories, and it just seemed to get better and better. Hello. Um, How's it going? We are coming in with uh, Waters to the Sea Treasure Island virtual tour, uh, which is going to feature uh, Jacqueline Richard and John Shepard. Uh, so we're going to get started with this very uh, right now. In fact, I want to uh, throw out uh, uh, thanks to two other uh, entities. One is to the Moreau Foundation for funding this and making things moving forward. Uh, we really appreciate their support on so many levels. Uh, and also thanks to Sarah Robertson for coordinating and making this uh, happen tonight. So uh, with that, I'm going to start with a little housekeeping. Uh, you can use uh, your chat to ask questions or to seek clarity. Uh, we monitor those questions. And after uh, Jacqueline uh, uh, presents and John talks a bit about Waters of the Sea, we will then uh, take questions. Uh, please keep your microphone on mute so we can uh, have a, a nice uh, quiet time for Jacqueline to present. Uh, you certainly may turn your video on or off as you, as you please. Uh, and once again, to remind people that the webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the webinar uh, uh, after this uh, week or so, uh, so you can uh, relive the, uh, the glory of this presentation. We'd also like to remind you that uh, the, the links to every other webinar we have done is on that, and there have been some really wonderful ones that we have seen. Uh, so with that, I think we'll get started. What's the next slide, John? Uh, as we can see here, uh, Jacqueline Richard, uh, is uh, uh, is uh, a new friend. Actually, it's not so new anymore. We, we really hit it off about three or four years ago. And uh, when she came up to our task, uh, we really cemented that friendship. And her love of geology is an incredible uh, inspiration. Uh, and her love of teaching is also something in incredible. Uh, she is with the Fletcher Technical Community College, the Interim Dean of STEM, Associate Professor of Geology, and the Director of the Fletcher Institute of Coastal Studies. Uh, but I think really uh, the, the best way to say is a geology uh, geek or freak is the best way to describe Jacqueline. Uh, it is just a remarkable uh, love of that that I just really appreciate. Uh, and John Shepard uh, has been with Hamlin for over 25 years, uh, and he will be sharing a bit of, with us about our uh, Waters to the Sea program. Uh, he is the assistant director and has been involved with our multimedia work. Uh, so with that, uh, I think we are ready to move into the next uh, phase. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, I would definitely probably agree with the uh, geology freak or geek bit, however you want to take that. So I certainly appreciate. All right, let me get this going here. So um, tonight, I'm really excited to share with you a brand new um, field trip uh, that we have developed. Let me go ahead and move this over here real quick. So um, hopefully everything here will work. So let me go ahead and, and let's go ahead and just jump right on in here. So I'm gonna take you through um, the development of this, uh, why it's important, and then we're gonna take a look at the actual tour itself. So uh, like every good teacher here, I'm gonna start with a quiz. You didn't know we were gonna start with a quiz today, but we're gonna go ahead and do that. 
So anybody have any idea what area this is on the map? And maybe uh, what year you might think this represents? Feel free to toss that in the chat. I'd be curious to see what, uh, what people think here. We'll give it a second. Let's go close by. Where am I? So hopefully we can narrow down the state here if you paid attention to my mm -hmm. the, uh, introduction. Anybody have any guesses on dates? Definitely Louisiana, great job there. And the Gulf of Mexico, you can totally see that for sure. 2050, projection in the future. I would love to see this much land in the future. That would be great. That would mean we are definitely doing some things right for sure. 2000, so 22 years ago, not a bad guess. I'll give it another couple seconds. So this is actually from 1932. So I'm pretty sure before any of us were born on this, uh, on this meeting today. So this is from quite a long time ago. And our virtual field trip is gonna narrow in right down in this region, right? Taking a look at these barrier islands. Um, but understanding these barrier islands in this location is obviously really important because of all the land that has been lost, right? Since 1890, We've lost over 1,900 square miles of coastline due to sea level rise and subsidence. And as we know, that this problem is only going to get worse. Unfortunately, the new NOAA predictions show that we're expecting potentially up to 18 inches of sea level rise in Louisiana in, by 2050, right? So that is not, not a long time from now. So it's really important for us to understand what's going on in this environment, but not just from an engineering and university level, but to be able to bring this to students that are younger that are gonna grow into these positions as they get older. So that 1900 square miles, right? If we break that down every year, what we see is 25 to 35 square miles of land basically, right, comes off the coastline. So it's not like these big chunks of land are falling off the coast, right? It's not like an iceberg. It's just little bits at a time. And that's what's so innocuous about it. You go stand on the coast and you watch the waves come in and every wave that comes in takes one little piece of sand, one little piece of sediment and carries it away. And that all adds up, right, every year to losing 25 to 35 miles. So if you break it down, I'm sure most of you have heard this uh, stat before, those of you that live in Louisiana, every 100 minutes we lose about a football field of land is what that equates to. So that's pretty quick. That's moving pretty fast. So it's really important for us to understand these processes. So before we jump into the field trip, I want to lay a little bit of groundwork. Why would we need to bring the coast to the classroom? We live in Louisiana, right? We should be able to bring students out to the coast. Why is it important for us to actually bring this into the classroom itself? Well, in Louisiana, we need the coast. We live in a state where most people, a lot of people depend on the coastal waters. Whether you know it is your job to go out and you're a shrimper, you're an oyster, you know, maybe you're bringing people on charter tours. The water is very important for us in Louisiana. However, that coastline isn't always accessible. Even though New Orleans is super close to the coast, way more close than many of us want it to be, it's not always easy to go rent buses and bring students down to the coastline. So it's really important to be able to bring this location into the classroom. And it's really important because we need to engage the next generation of scientists, engineers, and problem solvers. In Louisiana, we are facing a huge problem. You just saw how much land has been lost since 1932. Well, we know that that problem's only going to accelerate. And we need to rely on these younger generations to help us solve this problem or figure out how we're going to live and manage this problem. And really, we also need to create this investment in our future, right? So the, the children of, you know, in middle school now, the children in second grade, right, that's our future. And they're gonna be dealing with a different landscape in 20 years. I personally have a 16 year old and a six year old. The world for them when they become my age is gonna look very different, right? Especially if they live in coastal Louisiana. They're gonna have to deal with things like 
major sea level rise issues, engineering challenges that come with sea level rise and restoration practices, how the flora and fauna are gonna move around. We can't expect, right, oysters to live where they currently live. They're not gonna live there in 20 years. Those locations are gonna move. <laughs> also, <laughs> we also have to educate to influence, right? We know, and this statistic always blows my mind and I find it really, really inspirational, especially when talking to my first grader, that 65% of jobs that kindergartners are going to have, current kindergartners haven't even been invented yet. So that means by educating all of, all of these younger generations, we're potentially influencing what pathways they're going to take as adults. We also know from an education level that place-based learning allows for a deeper connection to place and instills that intrinsic value. It just allows for better, better understanding. We all know if you're sitting and watching a movie, you're going to pay more attention if it's a movie that's filmed in your hometown than maybe a movie filmed somewhere else because you recognize all the places. And so that's really important when we're educating younger people about these places and about these problems is that we're teaching them about the place that they live in. So let me give you a little bit of a backstory. And yes, this is a whole bunch of coastal planting pictures um, because this idea came about because of my love of putting trees in the ground. To me, there is nothing better than getting out there, putting my hands in the dirt, feeling the place, understanding where I'm at and knowing I'm making a difference. And it's really a feeling you can't quite describe. I bring students, I bring friends, I basically bring anybody that I can talk into coming out with me when I do these things. And it's just a feeling you can't explain, but it's such an important feeling. It's such an important connection to place that I really wanted my own children to feel that. So I wanted to develop or, or start this pathway of developing this deep love of where we live and why we need to save it. Not just save the land because it protects us from hurricanes and it protects my home and I don't wanna to have to build a new home, but it's also protecting the culture. It's protecting a place that has been here longer than any of us have been alive. You know, civilizations and communities have come and gone in the last 100 years since 1932. And this is a place we're saving. There are stories here to tell. And so this virtual field trip really became a passion project for me. I wanted to be able to bring this love that I feel into the classroom to show the students what it's like to be on the coast, because some of these students may never get to the coast itself. So what is this virtual field trip before I show you? It is definitely an interactive, immersive learning experience to bring these coastal issues into the classroom themselves. Not just dumping the classroom or not just dumping the issues on the desk for the students to figure out, but it's bringing these issues to the students in a way that they can discover. So there's two main components to this virtual field trip. The first, and this is the part we're gonna look at here in a second, are videos to discover the importance of barrier islands. So this first project, this first virtual field trip is about the Caminata Headlands, which is located right next to Grand Isle. So those of you familiar with Louisiana. And we worked with Quipra to develop this project um, to celebrate an amazingly successful restoration project. And to bring about the awareness of why we need to restore our barrier islands, why they're important, not just for biodiversity and saving this place, but what these barrier islands actually do for an economic importance even, right, to, for the rest of the state and the country. So we have six different videos and we're gonna take a look at some of these. Um, but we also have these fantastic 360 investigations where students can go in and manipulate the environment to really explore what they're learning. And this is the part that's really important. You know, we all think back to our own education and I know I loved it when I was in school and the teachers pushed in the cart so we could all watch a video because we knew what was gonna happen that day. That's exciting. Well, students today don't quite feel the same way. That's really dated technology. They like to play video games. They like to have VR headsets. They're learning in a different way than we all learned, right, when we were in school. So it's really important that we change our methodology, we change our modality of teaching to match where the students are so it becomes meaningful. 
So I'm about to go into this virtual field trip, but you'll be able to see here that this is an interactive site. It's not labeled, you're gonna go through this one, two, three, four, and five. You get to explore the space and take a look at it in the way the things that interest you. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into this, but I do want to give a shout out to all of our project collaborators before we jump in. This idea was not built in a silo by any stretch of the imagination. This has been a really wonderful team that has built this project. Um, so our main partners here, we worked with Quipra, right, like I said, to highlight uh, one of their extremely successful restoration projects. Um, I work at Fletcher Technical Community College, so we are also a partner. Um, we are also very lucky to partner with the Lost STEM System, which is the, the STEM initiative for the entire state of Louisiana. Our specific region uh, at where Fletcher is located is region three. So we are very excited to be able to pilot this experience and pilot some professional development for teachers. We, we also partnered with Delta Discovery Tours, um, who is an ecotourism business that brings people out into the Delta to give them this also amazingly immersive experience. And Central Creativity helped us pull all this together and develop some amazing curriculum I'm gonna show you as well. So I'm really excited that we built this really strong team and I really can't wait to share this with you. So let's go ahead and take a look. Let's see if this link's gonna work. It's probably gonna take a while. So let me go ahead and stop this and get to the internet itself and show you. All right, one second. My clicking on the link made my computer not very happy. Give me one second, guys. I apologize. Let's see. My apologies for the technical issue here. Sorry for the technical issue there. Apparently uh, it did not like that link that I had, so I apologize. Let's go ahead and jump on in here. All right, hopefully everyone can see the website. Hopefully that technical issue has resolved. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into this virtual tour. So here we have our 360 video space. And so let me go ahead and stop this from spinning here real quick. But I wanna pull back so you guys can see this space. So this is a 360 video allowing the students to kind of explore this area. So this is Elmer's Island, right? Uh, this is the area that was restored. So we're gonna watch a couple of these videos. Don't worry, they're not 20 minute long videos. They're nice and short to keep everybody's attention. Um, but we have two areas of this island that was restored, right? Our headlands and then the back barrier marsh back here as well. So what's great about this is students can manipulate this space and move around. And you can see we have all these fantastic little hidden things, these little links, hot spots in here for students to click and explore. So we're gonna go ahead and watch this main video together. And then we're gonna explore a couple of these different um, spots in here. We're going to take a look at some of these 360 videos and some of these informational panels. And then I'll show you a couple other of these videos. So let's go ahead and take a look at this first one, setting up the importance of why we're doing this in the first place. Who doesn't love a day at the beach? Beautiful water to play in, warm sunshine raining down, and treasures to collect. Did you know that beaches are more than just a place to rest and relax? These picturesque locations also play a crucial role in protecting our nation's coastal assets. Barrier islands are the I said eat your food! ...in storm surge and help to mitigate or lessen the damage caused by wind and wave-driven erosional energy. We call these areas of a young barrier island headlands. One local Louisiana example is the Caminata headland located here on beautiful Elmer's Island, a barrier located 
in South Louisiana, next to the community of Grand Isle. Caminata has two main parts, the 14 mile long Headlands Beach and the area right behind the beach termed the Back Barrier Marsh. Many shorebirds like terns nest in the Headlands Dunes and many migratory birds stop along this beach for their first rest during the long north-south yearly migration. Over the last hundred years, Caminata has experienced significant erosion. Did you know that every year the headland shoreline moves landward by roughly 35 feet? That's a little bit longer than a school bus. This is all due to the power of erosion. When major weather events like Hurricane Katrina happen, the erosion rate can dramatically increase. But these headlands aren't the only area experiencing weather loss. The Back Barrier Marsh is also losing land at a remarkable pace. Wave-driven erosion, especially during hurricanes, can cut through or overtop the island beaches, resulting in great damage to the Back Barrier Marsh area. After the immense amount of land loss that Caminata suffered during Hurricane Katrina, it became clear that the beach and Back Barrier Marsh needed our help. But how? Preparing a broken beach and marsh requires a lot of planning, forethought, and patience. Did you know that beaches and dunes move? Each grain of sand moves parallel to the shoreline due to wave action, and we call that movement longshore drift. Believe it or not, beaches are not permanent, so developing long-term plans for these mobile regions can be tricky. We can help nature more quickly stabilize the island with such restoration practices as coastal planting, and the installation of dune fencing. While these efforts are crucial to preserving our barrier islands, they must also include plans to protect the ecosystem, supporting its biodiversity in the face of climate change and sea level rise. As we hope you can see, barrier islands are an important component of coastal protection. The Kamenata Headlands and Back Barrier Marsh Project is just one of many projects that the Coastal Wetlands Planning Protection and Restoration Act, or CWIPRA, are managing in partnership with state and national agencies to protect and preserve our nation's coastline. All right, so that is our main video, kind of setting up the importance, right? What we're gonna take a look at. And really, you know, when we take a look at building restoration projects, there's a lot of components that go into this. You know, we can talk everything from engineering down to the animals that live there. There's a lot of bits and pieces that we can talk about. So we have several videos that are embedded in here to deal with those issues. And we want to break it down in a way that's palatable and manageable for classrooms. Now, this is definitely geared towards middle school. Um, definitely can be kind of bulked up with some great discussion for, you know, some lower level high school students. And definitely some of these videos are appropriate for, say, fourth and fifth grade as well. But as we look here, before we dive into some of these other videos, I want to show you some of my personal favorite parts. I am definitely an explorer. Uh, if you haven't maybe noticed from some of my pictures that I've shown, I like to go around and I like to check things out. And so the way this is set up is it really allows the student to explore their space. I like to think of this as a living textbook. And if I had textbooks like this when I was in school, I probably would have been, I was a good student, but I probably would have been a much better student. So I love these informational panels that we have buried in here. So you see these eyes and you can click on them and learn little bits of information. For instance, here we have some information about dune fencing the dune fencing that was put up on Elmer's Island. We can click back here and take a look at some invasive species like Nutria and learn all about these cute little but very, very damaging creatures. Now, my absolute personal favorite part of this is looking at the 360 videos. And to me, this is really what set this idea apart because it allows the students to look at something that they're a little bit more familiar with, right? Interact with things in a way that they know, but give them the space to explore. So for instance, let's take a look at this video. This is about, uh, we're gonna click here, and this is about the pneumatophores on a mangrove. So we literally took our camera, our 360 camera, and shoved it into these pneumatophores. And this kind of allows the students to really get in here and see what they look like. 
you know, a lot of these students, if they don't ever get a chance to travel down to Grand Isle or travel to Elmer's Island, may never get a chance to see a mangrove. So they can take a look down in here and see what these nematophores look like, see what these trees look like. But as you can see, they can really manipulate the entire space to take a look at what's there. I personally think this is super cool. You can take a look at a couple others here. I gotta move our zoom faces here real quick. So another one that's really fun, I'm gonna show you two of them. Um, we have one out here of a lift boat because who doesn't like boats? Everybody loves boats. And so we took our 360 camera and put it on our drone and flew the drone out here to take a look at the boats that are out in this region. So here you can see this lift boat. Of course, we, uh, we went ahead and grayed out the phone number on there so no uh, sixth grader could start making a whole bunch of phone calls to this company. Um, but you can take a look and see what this looks like. And what's really great is anybody from around the country can take a look at these videos. So this may be a boat that you've never seen before and want to explore. So it gives people a chance to learn something new here. Let me show you one more of these 360 videos before we take a look at a couple of these shorter videos. But this is a great one. So Dr. Clint Coleman uh, was our drone operator and I know he's on, on this call tonight. He, um, he's our law STEM director and he did a great job filming these drones, uh, these drone shots. And you can see here we're flying over the island so you can get a sense of space as to where the uh, beach is versus where the back barrier marsh is. And you can get kind of a whole tour, right, of the island itself. Well, let's go ahead and watch a couple of these other videos. So I want you to notice the different topics. So here we've got coastal erosion, economic importance, biodiversity, engineering an island, and sea level rise. Let's go ahead and take a look at engineering an island. Oh, I guess my computer had other plans. Due to its large geographical footprint, the compound project is divided into two major sections, the headland and dune restoration, as well as the back barrier marsh creation. During the headlands phase, a total of 8.7 million cubic yards of sediment were pumped in for the purpose of restoring these amazing beach and dunes of Kaminawa that received the brunt of all the storm energy in the Gulf of Mexico. As a result of this effort, over 14 miles of beach habitat were saved and strengthened. Additional engineering devices, such as dune fencing, were also installed during this phase to combat such factors as wind-driven erosion. The creation of the extensive back barrier marsh was also a massive undertaking, resulting in over 900 acres of salt marsh created. Together, the Kamakata Headlands and Dune Restoration Phase, along with the back barrier marsh creation phase, are representative of Louisiana's coastal restoration success stories. This is an incredibly large engineering feat that illustrates how important and impactful our efforts can be to support a thriving and safe coastal ecosystem. Have you ever considered the engineering challenges involved in coastal restoration? What do you think some of those challenges might be? How would you solve them? Finally, how might these challenges identified in the Kamenata project be different from those found in other coastal environments? So you're gonna see here in a few minutes how we develop some curriculum to go with this project. But I really love the fact that we included some great discussion questions at the end of these videos. So these videos are all meant to be standalone as well. So that way anybody right from the community, anybody around the world can watch these, but it's really gonna prompt people to think a little bit deeper about what they're seeing. So we talk about restoring this large space, but what does that actually mean? What actually goes into it? So hopefully it's prompting people to think just a little bit deeper. So this is the tough part, because I really want to show you, just show you all the videos. But let's take a look at just a few others. So let's take a look over here at biodiversity. The Back Barrier Marsh supports the highest amount of biodiversity on Kaminata. This restored area is a large salt marsh ecosystem. A healthy back barrier marsh is not only important to the local flora and fauna, it also impacts us. 
The back barrier marsh plays an important role in slowing down wave energy and trapping sediment during major weather events before they can wreak havoc along our coastline. Salt marshes can be identified by measuring their salt concentration or salinity. These ecosystems can also be identified by the types of plants that can be found within them. One major identifier of a salt marsh is the presence of black mangrove trees. These unique trees breathe through the use of nematophores, which are tiny roots that stick up around the base of the tree and behave like a snorkel, allowing this hardy species to breathe while standing in water. Wildlife thrives in this environment too. Many birds, like pelicans and the threatened piping clover, call this salt marsh home. Larger animals, like terrapins and dolphins, are also found here. Invasive species are a concern at Kalmanata, just as they are around the country. Animals, such as the nutria, are not native to the area and have a tendency to consume all the local flora, which doesn't leave room for the native species. Since losing native species disrupts the food chain, how do you think that impacts the overall ecosystem? All right. So like I said, I really like those discussion questions at the end. You know, it's giving people something to, to chew on just a little bit. Let's just watch one more video. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at coastal erosion. When figuring out how to combat erosion, we should think about the differences between the two main types, wind and water-driven erosion. Barrier islands are going to experience both. Areas that are experiencing higher wind-driven erosion can be identified by extensive dune formations. It's important to note that these dunes will migrate. One way to slow down wind-driven erosion is through the use of dune fencing. These fences help trap moving sand and slow the rate of migration. The other type of erosion affecting barrier islands is wave driven. As each wave hits the beach, grains of sand are picked up and moved down the beach parallel to the shoreline. To help slow wave erosion, planting vegetation is one of the biggest defenses. The roots of these plants go into the ground like a net, helping to hold the sediment in place. When large tropical storms or hurricanes hit, wave energy is stronger, which through overtopping can create cuts straight through the islands. These cuts will eventually repair themselves through the actions of sand migration, otherwise known as longshore drift. We can help accelerate the rebuilding process through engineered restoration. What do you think some of the impacts would be if we stop protecting and restoring our nation's barrier islands? All right, so hopefully you guys are seeing how powerful these videos are. Like I said, not just in the classroom and breaking students out into small groups for discussion, but for everybody to consume. They're bringing pretty important topics or subtopics about these restoration areas into the mainstream, into the light for people to really think about and digest. And also, I won't lie, it was really great to spend a couple of days on the boat out here filming this. That was really kind of the best part. All right, so we have, like I said, this fantastic 360 space. I will tell you, if you're looking for a little bit of peace and calm, this is by far one of the better 360 videos just a nice shot of uh, some wave action here. So if you, if you need to, to take a nap in the afternoon, this is a nice little one to relax to. Or if you're a teacher and you really want to put the kids to sleep, this might be a good one. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing here for a second. We're going to go back to the PowerPoint because I want to talk about the second part of this. Give me a second here to turn this off so we don't have the birds chirping in the background as nice as they are to hear. So the second component of this uh, virtual field trip is curriculum. So this whole experience is just enhanced with a curriculum, a week's worth of curriculum that's provided to the teachers and to the classroom. So we have six different investigations in these classroom kits that are uh, taking a look at the restoration practices uh, that were used at Kaminata. So the first one we have, um, I'm going to show you the actual curriculum guide here in a moment. We're going to take a look at wetland formation. 
We're going to also take a look at wave and wind erosion, as you heard about in that video. You also heard about dune fencing. So we have students investigate dune fences themselves and different designs that can be used. And uh, we also take a look at vegetation, how vegetation affects dunes themselves. And of course, we can't forget the A and STEAM. So we have a bit about wetlands art as well and that appreciation. So each one of these kits, um, like I said, we have classroom kits and individual kits. Um, so our classroom kits here, all the investigations are in these really beautiful bags. Um, I have them all right here next to me. They're really fantastic. They just printed really beautiful. And the best thing about these kits is that everything you need to complete the experiments is in the kit themselves. Everything is there except the water. And, you know, we've been using these kits with Central Creativity here for a little bit at my college, and they're fantastic. But I will tell you, um, this year, more than any, they, have, they are really important. Um, we were out at Kaminata in late July. Well, a month later, Ida hit this island head on. So the importance of barrier islands, really, this whole virtual field trip couldn't be any more timely than it is right now because of that massive hurricane. And for those of you that don't live in the region or don't live in Louisiana, Ida has still really taken effect. There are still some schools that are just coming back online down in that region and some schools that haven't even gone back into service yet. Where I teach, we have a couple of high schools that have partnered together to share one facility, but they don't have any laboratory material because everything got wiped out. So this is actually really fantastic and not just a sense that we're making it easy for the teachers, but we're providing lab materials at this point for classrooms that literally don't have anything right now, wouldn't be able to run any experiments. So for me to know that we're able to make this difference, especially right now in these students' lives, is just, it's really, it's really touching for me. I really enjoy being able to do that. So we have these classroom kits and then we have some individual kits for homeschool students, or for those of you that like uh, to, to do some experiments as well. But we're gonna go ahead and jump into the curriculum guide. So let me stop sharing this again for a second and we're gonna go jump back over to the land of the internet and hopefully it won't um, shut down this time. So here we are on the main page for the virtual tour and we clicked this big um, orange button before to take a look at the tour itself. But if we scroll down here, we actually have quite a bit of information um, and we're gonna take a look at this activity guide, but I do wanna just scroll through here for a minute to show you this, this landing page. So we have some great information up here as well. You can navigate to these different investigations, right, in the activity guide. We have some information about Quipper itself because they are a fantastic agency that clearly facilitates some amazing and very much needed restoration projects. Um, here we have some facts, right, about Louisiana itself, as you guys saw. And my, in my beginning slides, right, that we lost 1,900 miles of square, or square miles of land. And then this is a great little lanyard piece that I just really love. Sometimes it's really hard to visualize how much land has actually been lost. So this is a really great slider going from 1985 to 2020. You can really, really viscerally see how much land has been lost. I really wish we could go back to how much land we had in 1985. That's a pretty amazing amount. So for those of you that are not necessarily familiar with Louisiana, the, this virtual field trip is right down in this region where you see all these lines on that map. We also have a project gallery that'll be populated with students' materials. So as classrooms are going through um, this curriculum and going through the experiments themselves. We definitely encourage students to take some pictures and using some hashtags, we can upload these video or these pictures up here of students actually working on the experiments. Um, here you can see some behind the scenes uh, shots right now of us while we were out there working. It was a really, really great week being out there. And then of course, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be a coastal restoration thing if we didn't have a call to action. As you guys saw, I really love to volunteer. Um, and so we really always encourage everybody to volunteer and get out there. Because if everybody planted one tree, we would make a big difference. So let's go ahead up here and take a look at that curriculum guide. So in each uh, box itself, there is a printed 
curriculum guide, which I have it right here. It's really pretty. Um, it's got the map on the bottom. It's really my favorite part. Um, but it comes with the student guide, and then there is the teacher guide as well. But this is the this is the student guide, and we obviously have this PDF, so that way you know students that want to maybe explore this when they get home from class can go back in and take a look. Or maybe they were sick. We know we're still in the days of COVID, um, and you know, of course, we always have a big homeschool population, especially since the pandemic. So this really allows everybody to take a look at this material. So each section, like I said, we have several main sections in here. It's a little bit of textbook and a little bit of experiment. So we have this beautiful curriculum that's aligned with NGSS standards. So it's easily deployed in the classroom. Here you can see we're teaching about wetland formation and going through some of the major ecosystems here, deltas and marshes, swamps and barrier islands. So again, it's using that um, location, you know, that personal location that everybody's used to living in Louisiana. You know, and that's the thing, you can learn about tornadoes in Kansas all day, but if you live in Louisiana, you want to learn about hurricanes, you want to learn what happens to you. And so this is a great way to, to facilitate that learning. So here we can see our first experiment that would be in the box, and it's building a dune. So the first thing that they're going to do is learn how dunes are built, and learn how water moves across the system. As you saw in those videos, we talk about longshore drift and how that sediment physically moves. And one great thing that I really love about these experiments is you can see here we have everything broken down into steps, so it's very easy to follow. However, we know some people are visual learners. We won't watch this whole video, but I do want to show you that we have um, these experiments also broken down into videos to make it very easy for students and teachers to follow. So each video walks through the experiment and what it's going to look like. We'll let this first one play so you have an idea of what these look like. So that way there's no question, right, on how that experiment's supposed to run. You've got your steps to follow and that video to follow, which is great. And here you can see we have data collection for the students, so they're being actively engaged citizen scientists. Uh, of course, we have pictures in here that are um, that were provided from Quipra and from Delta Discovery Tours, so they're all place-based uh, for students to identify. And I'm just going to kind of walk you through some of these experiments because I'm really excited about these and I really can't wait to see what students think of these experiments as they're going through them. I can't wait to see all the pictures that get populated on the website. But the second experiment is about wave erosion. So as you saw in that video, right, we have wave and wind erosion. So we want the students to investigate what both of these look like, right, and, and think about, right, when we're engineering an island, when we're making these restoration practices, how do we forward think? How do we think about wave erosion and wind erosion down the line, right, 20 years or 15 years after we started building this area? How do we deal with these things? So in this second experiment, the students generate waves to see what happens. How does that sediment move with those waves, right? How does longshore drift work? The third investigation deals with, wave, uh, with wind erosion. So in this one, they're actually building a fan uh, which is great. So we have these little fans um, that they build. So it's a little bit of an engineering challenge. Um, so they get to physically wire the fan and put the fan together. And then they test it on the dune to see how the wind affects the sand as well. Because we know, right, the sand is going to move differently with the wave and water action than it does with the wind action. But we have both to worry about, especially on an island. And so here you can see we're also having them record data and measure data. So in their little classroom teams, right, that they're going to be working on these experiments with, they'll be able to designate, right, who's taking measurements, who's recording data, and just promoting that teamwork. And so from there now we move in protection and restoration. We've learned some of the problems. 
very short bit of problems, natural problems, and how do we deal with those themselves? And so for the next experiment, they're gonna design a windbreak. We have dune fencing all over Elmer's Island. I was actually part of that team that got to put some of those dune fences in place. And so we know dune fences really work. They help trap the sand. And so the students are uh, gonna have popsicle sticks and they can develop their own design of fences, whether it's a traditional fence design, or as you can see here, maybe some other design, put it in the dune themselves and then use the fan again to see how that stops potentially, right, the sand from moving or slows it down at least. And then one of the last pieces here with that same dune is now we're gonna veg it out. Because we know, as you saw in that video, putting trees in the ground, putting grass in the ground is also extremely helpful as those roots go down into the ground and hold everything in place. And so now these students uh, are given ryegrass, which grows pretty quickly. Um, so it's not, uh, you're not waiting for, for big sunflowers to grow or anything of that nature. It's just quick ryegrass and then they can test it again with the fan to see what kind of a difference that makes between the dune fencing and the vegetation itself. And then of course you can see here, they can also test that with the wave action. So what I really love about this is it's all building on top of, you know, on top of that first experiment. It's just taking what they've learned and now taking it a little step further and taking it another little step further after that. Of course, we also have to have wetlands art because we know art is one fantastic way to make scientific observations. Uh, it's really important that students know you don't have to be the best artist in the world. Lord knows I am not at all. Those I know I see uh, Ignacion here who's one of my students. She can definitely attest that I cannot draw by any stretch of the imagination. However, it is a really fantastic scientific tool and a way to make observations is by recording through art. And so including this art piece is also incredibly important. So let me jump out of this curriculum piece to tell you the next exciting part. Let me get back to this PowerPoint. So the, the part that I'm really excited about bringing this all together is that we're gonna take these classroom kits and with um, support from Quipra and Lost STEM, we are going to be um, bringing this to 100 middle school classrooms in the four coastal highlighted regions um, within the state of Louisiana. And so this is going to be introduced um, into the classroom for students to use. So each, each of these Lost STEM regions will get 25 boxes um, for these middle school teachers. And we're going to be working with our law STEM directors to help provide the professional development. And I really can't wait for that part. To me, that part feels like a field trip. I love teaching the teachers. There is nothing better than getting this into the hands of teachers who are really going to use this and bring it to life in the classroom. Um, and so we're hoping to bring this into light uh, and start doing this professional development late May, early June. Um, so that way we can start seeing this in the classrooms in the fall. So for those teachers that live in Louisiana, if you are interested, if you're on the Zoom and you're interested, um, or if you know a teacher in Louisiana in one of these coastal regions, please feel free to grab that QR code. It'll bring them to this sign up um, so that way they can sign up for that professional development. It's kind of first come first serve, but we're gonna to try to make sure that things are evenly distributed between the parishes. That way all the parishes get representation. And if you are a Minnesota teacher and you're still really interested because we know uh, as Tracy and John love to preach and I am there with them 100%, we are all about one river thinking, right? The headwaters is definitely connected to the Delta. If you are interested in that, be sure to sign up for the River Institute because we're gonna be bringing this up to Minnesota with us bringing these boxes so that way everybody can dig into it, everybody can take a look at the curriculum and everybody can go through the fantastic experiments. And so with that, that concludes my virtual field trip. Um, so John, I can leave that to you or take questions, um, whichever part comes next. Great, thank you so much, Jacqueline. So I think what we'll do is um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes touching on um, some of the resources that we already have available for folks um, through our uh, Waters to the Sea program that would be complements to uh, the great resource that Jacqueline 
uh, just introduced to us. If you do have questions, we are, when I'm done, uh, after a few minutes, we'll have a chance for some Q&A. So feel free to uh, put your uh, questions into the uh, chat um, and we will have some time for that. So um, just a little background, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this program. Um, those of you that aren't, um, the Waters to the Sea is, a, we think of it as our flagship watershed education resource um, that our, the Center for Global Environmental Education has developed, um, the first version of which came out in the year 2000. So uh, it's in its 21st year and has evolved uh, with technology over time. And uh, the current version that we're looking at here is focused on the Mississippi River. We've done versions of this program in other watershed regions around the country. Um, this one is a very rich and full uh, learning experience. It's targeted really to the same grade range that uh, the Kamida uh, virtual tour is uh, designed for. Uh, we think of it you know, stretching into the upper elementary aids, uh, grades and uh, through middle school is really the target, the target area. Um, but also, there, as you'll see, if you explore, there's, there's content that can be adapted uh, above and below those grade ranges as well. So you could think of Waters to the Sea as a, as a virtual journey. That's one way to think about it. It is, it's, uh, it's not absolutely comprehensive, but it is a very rich resource in terms of the amount of uh, media stories, interactive learning experiences that are integrated within it. Probably five or six hours of content total. And it really covers the um, uh, from headwaters to the Gulf, the entire stretch of the river. Uh, so this is the, the entry page, the, the main menu page that you uh, first will land on. There are four modules here on the right that we think of as introductory that provide some conceptual background. Uh, the water cycle, what is a watershed? We have a built-in water quality lab, a virtual lab. That's an introduction to that. And then uh, some introduction to concepts of how ecosystems function. We have a one minute Mississippi video that follows a raindrop from the headwaters uh, to the Gulf and kind of um, uh, identifies some of the changes that the, rivers, the river goes through in its journey. So these are introductory elements. I'll also mention that you'll see um, at the top of the screen or near the top here, a reference to the Mighty Mississippi um, uh, PBS documentary that we co-produced with WYES New Orleans. And this is really designed as a great companion to that. And we have elements of the uh, documentary built in here. So this is the, you look across the top of the screen, you'll see tabs that lead to different areas of content. Um, we're on the intro screen. I'm gonna click the river map and uh, this, this um, uh, learning experience is, is what's called a story map. And, and so it integrates very rich uh, dynamic uh, map content with storytelling. So it, it, it kind of um, it combines both of those. Uh, so in the map area, you can see the, the uh, ribbon of water flowing from Itasca, Lake Itasca, Minnesota, down to the Gulf. And um, the red dots along the line are place-based uh, stories or place-based multimedia content. So this, uh, clicking the river map, uh, provides you access to everything that's in the program. And you can access that through uh, the map, but also through this uh, scrolling um, uh, menu on the left side. And as I go forward, uh, I'm going to be zooming into different locations uh, as, as you progress through here. So right up here, uh, just scrolled onto the our headwaters panorama. So that, that takes us up to uh, Lake Itasca. So that's one way of finding all the content in the program. The other tabs across the top, most of them are subsets of all of the content that is in the river map. So if I click the life science tab, I'll see the same map again. There'll be fewer green dots on the river line because only those that relate to life sciences are gonna show up in this case. So that's how um, 
that's how content is broken out by subject matter. Um, and so exploring these tabs is one way of, of zooming in on content that might be relevant uh, to what you would be teaching in the classroom. You can also look at the media index. And this is another way of getting at everything that's in the program. In this case, uh, everything is listed uh, through the scrolling menu again, but now it's broken down by the media types. And I wanna point out a couple of them in particular that uh, relate very closely to uh, the presentation that Jacqueline just gave. We have interactives, that's the first group. We have uh, 360 interactive panoramas, uh, 360 videos, and then uh, a large number of short high definition videos on a wide range of topics. That is the bottom section there. So I'm gonna go back to the interactive section. And if I scroll down a little bit, you can see two of them that specifically talk about the Delta, Delta through time and Delta ecosystems. Uh, and these two modules, I think, would be a wonderful correlation to um, what uh, Jacqueline just shared, the Kamida virtual tour. So the Delta through time really looks at the evolution of the Mississippi River Delta going back 200 million years. We developed a video uh, working with Jacqueline that we've uh, showcased in earlier webinars, Ancient Origins of the Gulf. It's about three, four minutes long, and it takes you through a 200 million year journey showing how the Gulf of Mexico was formed and how the very early uh, beginnings of the Mississippi River Delta was formed. And then uh, below that, we have the birth of the bird's foot Delta. So that's really the last 6,000 years of history, of geologic history. Um, and this is um, a series of visualizations created by Dan Swenson of the Times-Picayune uh, and the Advocate. Uh, a lot of folks are familiar with it um, uh, in the Delta who are doing coastal education work. Uh, his original visualizations uh, became outdated technologically. And so we have uh, brought them back to life by uh, recreating them as short videos. So if I click on that, um, it's going to start uh, playing here. So you can see we've broken it down by segments. So you can uh, look sequentially at each of these uh, periods of time. And it chronicles how the Delta evolved during those periods of time. And then moving into the, the present day, um, how human activities uh, have impacted uh, that that landscape. Uh, and then the the other piece I'll talk about Delta ecosystems over here. This um, uh, has a cross section, as you can see, of the Delta environment, very condensed. So uh, you have the Gulf over on the open Gulf waters on the right, Barrier Island um, with the pelicans perched on, on top of it there next to the open Gulf, all the way up to um, Cypress uh, forests, cypress swamps uh, in the upper delta, and then multiple levels of marsh and open estuary. So this is really an introduction to, if you think about traveling from, uh, you know, down the delta uh, toward the Gulf, walking through each of the different ecosystem uh, regions that you would pass through. And of course, everything that uh, Jacqueline was focusing on would relate more to the barrier island. So this, you know, kind of would place that uh, presentation in a broader context. And so there are interactive elements here. Clicking on each one of these, you get uh, a, a different a map showing where uh, forested wetlands and uh, freshwater marsh, intermediate marsh, brackish marsh, saltwater marsh are found, color-coded on the map. We have 360 panoramas, uh, image galleries that uh, walk you through an understanding of what these different ecosystems are like. There's also uh, a final interactive, we call the saline solution, where uh, you, uh, are, you go through a little interactive where you need to, uh, working with the um, life cycle of the blue crab, uh, which the blue crab in its in nine, uh, we, we isolate a few of the phases of the life cycle of the blue crab and look at how, uh, how crabs adapt or make use of different level, different areas within the estuary and different levels of salinity. So it's an interactive uh, experience that, that has you work through that. So these two, the Delta through time, Delta ecosystems are two in particular that would be 
uh, really relevant and connected to the work that um, Jacqueline's doing. We also, this spring, are going to be building more content around these topics, uh, looking in particular at the lines of defense and uh, looking at the, um, you know, some of the other uh, engineering solutions that are presented in the uh, Coastal Master Plan for the state of Louisiana uh, and, and, and creating visualizations that will bring those uh, clearly to life um, to help uh, folks really understand um, you know, what's at stake in uh, addressing some of the land loss issues that are occurring in the Delta and what some of those solutions look like. Um, so that's pretty much a pretty good overview. The other thing I'll just mention, way over on the right here, there's a tab that uh, just has a little symbol here. Uh, there's some additional content uh, accessible here, depending on your screen resolution, you may see all of these elements that are listed vertically here. They may show up as tabs. It just depends on uh, how your browser is configured. And uh, so there's an educator resources section, just to mention that, where we have taken all of the interactive content in Waters to the Sea, correlate, correlated it with um, next generation science standards, uh, for fifth grade and for sixth through eighth grade. So you can click on these links and it opens up. Uh, it's another way of accessing the individual parts of this program uh, and, and looking at how they correlate with uh, different standards. We also have a, a scavenger hunt, which can be a great way for uh, students to begin to explore this. And uh, it, it gives you some hints to try and find certain uh, key uh, content areas. We also have a lot of lesson plans and activities that are complementary uh, to the interactive content that is in the program. So I will pause there and uh, we've got a little bit of time uh, for questions and answers. Again, if you uh, have uh, questions you'd like to pose for Jacqueline or for me or for Tracy, uh, please drop those into the chat and we'd be happy to uh, have a little dialogue here. Don, I've, I've got a few questions that I jotted down, uh, but uh, this is uh, for Jacqueline. Uh, how did the hurricane impact the barrier island? You talked about the before and after. Can you just talk about how things went down there? Yeah, so um, besides obviously, you know, structures and, you know, loss of things in that way, uh, geologically, what's really interesting is there's a, prog a process where um, barrier islands, you know, as you saw in that main video, retreat, they move backwards and so, or closer to the coastline. So the hurricane caused um, quite a bit of, of retreat. I don't know the actual number offhand. I want to say it was like 20 feet or so of coastal retreat, um, but the beach did permanently move backwards. Um, so there was quite a bit of headlands that was lost. Um, but what's, what's really, what's even more interesting in my opinion, and I apologize, I'm going to, I'm going to totally geek out. This is where Tracy was right. Um, if you, if you take a look at Elmer's Island itself, um, there's a big levee that runs down the, the beach side and the, the seaside. And it's called a burrito levee because in the center of it, right, there's this structure, right, that kind of helps hold it all intact. Well, that was washed out uh, during the hurricane. And so if you look at NOAA imagery uh, right after the hurricane, you'll see that there's a little skinny beach and then what almost looks like a canal or a bayou and then the land. And so what's really cool about that, I mean, besides the fact this is a horrible human tragedy and all these things, but geologically it's really neat. So what's really interesting about that is what would have happened naturally had humans not intervened is that little tiny strip of beach that was kind of on the other side of that burrito levee would have gotten washed away completely. And you would be left with a small ridge there that gets recorded. And now you would have a new permanent beach, right? That's further back. And so when we take a look at Elmer's Island, if you go on Google Earth, and I'm really struggling to not just pull it up and show you all the things. Um, but if you go look on Google Earth, you'll see that series of lines behind Elmer's Island. That represents those beach ridges that were once there that got abandoned during hurricane events, major storm events, major sea level rises, and then that beach permanently retreated. So it's a really cool process that we don't ever really get to see because it requires a main event uh, like that to happen. Um, but 
the long and short of it is, is that the uh, hurricane caused uh, quite a bit of land loss in the Back Barrier Marsh, uh, which I know that they are going to be working to restore and uh, caused a permanent beach retreat, um, which, you know, you can restore a little bit, but it is kind of difficult to recover from some of those things. I'm glad, you know, I'm, I, I credit you for not pulling that up. Very, very good restraint. Thank you. <laughs> not that it wouldn't have been great. Uh, um, here's another <laughs> more focus question. Uh, can someone outside of the service area get their hands on that, uh, get the hands on materials? Is there a, a pathway for that? Yes. Um, I'm going to put an email in the chat. Um, so the, we have a quipper contact that is taking people's information that's interested um, in asking further questions, maybe getting some professional development or looking to purchase kits for their classroom. So I'm going to um, open my email, copy and paste her email, it's a very long last name, and I'll put it in the chat. So that way, if you are interested in getting those materials and you live out of the service area, you can have that at your, at your fingertips. Uh, another, uh, well, I want to build on that. Uh, we are offering, we'll talk, I think Sarah will give more details, but uh, in, the, in June of this year, we will be working with the Miro Foundation and colla collaborators and partners uh, from the 13th uh, to the 16th or so to do a Rivers Institute where we're going to focus on the Delta. Uh, and then in July, we'll be doing one up in Minnesota from the 18th through the uh, 20th of July at the 21st. So we have some fun things coming up and our, it's our hope and plan that we will be able to share some of these materials to folks that are coming to that institute. If that'll work out, we would love to make that happen. Uh, and uh, that's just super exciting. Uh, I know you also have plans for new program content areas. Can you give us, uh, what's your next, uh, what's the next one up uh, that you want, uh, story you want to tell? Is that for me? That is for you, <laughs> yes. Excellent. So we're working on, um, hopefully if, if all the funding comes through, um, we're working on our next location. It's a location called BS11. Um, which is on the east bank of the Mississippi River. Um, so it's actually, so we're moving locations. So our hope is that we're going to highlight Quipper projects um, all around the, the coastal regions of the state and use this as an opportunity to bring different ecosystems into the classroom. So the next one is along the Mississippi River, which gives us a chance to talk about um, river processes, how sediment works in the river, how deltas are built, we can talk a little bit about the sediment diversion that's coming in, uh, but it's a really successful terrace field um, on the east bank of the river that has built an amazing amount of land and it's just absolutely gorgeous. So I cannot wait to highlight that area and spend more time on the boat. What parish is that in? Uh, it's in Plaquemines Parish. Okay. Well, that's uh, any other questions, please uh, uh, jot them into the chat. If not, I think we've We've accomplished what we want to do tonight is to have a great launch of this fantastic program. It is so exciting to see. I know you've worked very hard on it and a lot of your dreams are coming true. Let's help make some more of those things come together and get young people and, uh, and old people, I guess, but young people engaged to do some, uh, some good stewardship of this world. Yep, there we go. We do have, yep, some, uh, some closing stuff here about the face-to-face -face, uh, summer institutes. Um, we're, like uh, Tracy was saying, we've got one in the Delta, one in the Mississippi Headwaters, and then we also have Waterworks, which is a drinking water institute, which will be held in Rochester, Minnesota. And then, uh, John, if you want to go to the next. Yep. So then if you guys have questions or anything, feel free to contact us at cg at hamlin.edu. Um, I'll be sending out an email with the recording and the resources that were shared tonight. And then if you are wanting to get 1.5 continuing education units, go ahead and uh, fill out the form from this, uh, this website. I'll send that out in the email as well. So yeah.